probably heard of the GAS phenomenon. This is the acronym for Gear Acquisition Syndrome and describes the need to get new stuff. GAS is very well known in the photographic community. It is sometimes quite difficult to resist the attraction of new photographic gear. One method I use to be sure that I really want a certain thing, a camera, a lens or whatever it is, is this. I take the object of desire and start looking for an alternative that is as cheap as possible, that fulfills the need of my guess for maybe only 50%. If it turns out that the alternative is good enough, then it's alright and I have saved money. If it turns out that the alternative is exactly what I want, but I need a higher quality, then I buy the original object of desire and sell the old one. Here is an example. I was looking for a 70-200 lens for Sony E-mount. There are three lenses on the market to choose from. All cost over 1100 euro, one almost 3000. So I started looking for an adaptable alternative and in the end I bought a manual 80 to 200 lens from Canon and achieved really excellent results over the last three years. Till today the cheaper option is in my backpack at almost every trip I make. Another guess that always gets me is the one for Leica cameras. Now these cameras are obviously very expensive and the hurdle to buy one is quite high. That's why again I started looking for the cheapest possible alternatives and today I would like to present my top 5 that already have made it into my camera cabinet. Maybe this technique will help you too and you can save your precious money and spend it otherwise. If not, hopefully you will at least enjoy some gear porn and have a look into my nice little list. If you have another interesting camera to add, please tell me in the comments. I would be very eager to look into those. So no more rambling, let's start with number 5. The Zorki one is a very close copy of the Leica 2 Barnack models and was built between 1949 and 1956. The Zorki one had several iterations in these years. I do not get into details now, but if you want more information, you can find them online. A link to a very detailed German language page is in the description. Because it is such a close copy to the Leica 2, it has definitely the Leica look. It is in fact a really beautiful camera which has the little something when it's held in one's hand. It feels definitely very sturdy. The Zorki one is a classical rangefinder camera of the first generation. This means there are two separate rangefinder windows which are overlaid and the one is coupled to the lens by a little lever. Changing focus on the lens changes the coupled rangefinder window. If you then exactly overlay both of the images, the focus is correct. The Zorki one has two windows, one for the rangefinder function I just told you and one for composing the image. This makes the workflow a little complicated because focusing and composing are two separate steps in which you have to change the window you are looking through. The Zorki one is a fully manual camera. Aperture, focus, exposure time all have to be set manually. Therefore this camera works totally without batteries but also without light meter. Be aware that old Soviet cameras always have to be cocked before you change the exposure time. If not, the camera could be damaged. The fastest shutter speed is 1 over 500, which is not that much to be honest. Also because of a bad quality control, you cannot be sure that the speeds work as correct as they should. So be aware of this too. The Zorki one uses the M39 Leica thread mount or LTM, which offers a large number of lenses. You can go cheap on old Soviet lenses like the Indostar 50mm f3.5 which was sold with lots of Zorki ones. The film loading is as bad as in the original Leica 2. The film has to be cut a little and inserted from the bottom after removing the bottom plate. Today the Zorki one can still easily be bought online because it was built in large numbers and is still pretty cheap. Quality is an issue, so it is all a little gambling to get a good one. Try to find a tested copy of a professional store. So all in all, this is a very basic camera with some things that make your life a little harder. It is very slow in using 
and therefore it represents definitely the way the old ancestors of photography used to go when they went out into the streets of New York to shoot their barnack likers. Number 4 on my list of poor man likers is again a Soviet rangefinder camera. In fact, it is just a more advanced model of the Zorki 1. I am talking about the Zorki 4 or 4K. The Zorki 4K is a later iteration of the old Leica 3 copies. It was again built in very large numbers for over more than 18 years from 1956 till 1973. Therefore, the quality is again not equal in every camera. Again, you should try to find a tested one and pay a little more. The main difference between the Zorki 4 and the 4K is the film bind lever. The Zorki 4K was intended for export sales only. The design has changed to the Zorki 1 and is more individual. The top element is much larger. It is maybe inspired by the look of the Leica M3 models, but inside it is still the origin of the Leica 2 with some improvements. So now the fastest shutter speed is 1 over 1000th and goes down to 1 over 30th of a second. But still you have to cock the shutter before changing the shutter speeds. The back plate is now removable, which makes the film insert much more convenient than in the Zorki 1. Also the viewfinder and the rangefinder are coupled now. Focusing and composing can now be done by looking through one window. But still, there are no frame lines inside that give you the hint of what is inside your frame. With all the improvements, the camera is still purely manual and mechanical, so no light meter and no battery, which can be a good or a bad thing. I personally like it. The Zorki 1 has the same M39 Leica thread mount and was usually sold with a Jupiter 8 50mm f2 lens, which could be a very decent lens if you, again, find a good copy. Even if the inside of the Zorki 4 and 4K is still a heritage of the old Zorki 1, the improvements make the Zorki 4 and 4K much more enjoyable to use. The combined and coupled rangefinder window, the film loading and the 1 over 1000s are definitely a large step forward. If you can find a copy which is tested and CL8, there is nothing wrong about this beautiful Leica copy. Let's raise the level of quality a little bit. Canon Canonet QL17 G3 is only one of many examples of high quality cameras of this type and era, but I like this one the most. Produced from 1972 on, this camera is the last iteration of its time. These cameras were made for people with higher interests in photography. Therefore, they still are a really good catch. The Canonet maybe isn't the closest to what you might think of when looking for a poor man's Leica, but there are some checkboxes the Canonet fills. At first, the Canonet is a rangefinder camera, which is also a significant part of shooting with a Leica 3 or Leica M. What you see is not what you get, and you always have to concentrate on the rangefinder patch in the viewfinder. Also, there is a little knob on the lens, which makes focusing really fast. The focus throw itself is also very short. So holding this camera, looking through the viewfinder, handling the knob, all this is what feels very similar to the Leica experience. But there are some significant differences. First being said is the leaf shutter, which no other Leica has. Leaf shutters have some advantages. They are very silent for example and very durable. But they are also not made for very fast shutter speeds. 1 over 500 is the limit. Another not like Leica point is the lens. It is fixed, which means it's not interchangeable. But this is nothing I want to take as point against the Canonet. The QL17 G3 has, as the name says, a 40mm f1.7 lens, which is very bright and very sharp. I would call the 40mm a sweet spot between 35 and 50mm which I would see as the main focal length used with a Leica. Therefore, this is different, but it is still a great lens. Also, even if the camera is fully mechanical as well, there is a light meter installed above the front lens and coupled to a time value automation. 
means you choose the exposure time, the camera sets the aperture value. It even prevents from over and under exposing the image if the settings are very off. Systems like this first appeared in the Leica M7 in the year 2002. It is also possible to shoot fully manual. But be aware, to use the light meter you have to make sure that your battery delivers the correct voltage of 1.35V, which can be achieved with a hearing aid battery or wine cells. Using 1.5V batteries will lead into wrong exposures. Last but not least, the camera has a Canon quick load system. Just make sure the filament goes into the right position, close the door and start cranking the lever. Normally you get up to 38 to 39 images out of one roll due to this system. So what's it about the Canonet? She's a really great camera, very comfortable for shooting due to the automatic, the quick load and its really sharp lens. The rangefinder and the focusing knob are maybe the only common thing to a Leica. The leaf shutter, the fixed lens and the design are not that much Leica-esque. But for a poor man's Leica I find the shooting experience close enough to get into this list. Finally it has to be said that the prices have increased over the last years, so maybe the poor man has to save a little longer to get this one. The next camera comes very close to a Leica again. The Voigtländer Besser R is a very modern camera in this list. It was introduced in the year 2000, therefore the inside of the camera is very modern and of high quality. There are several versions of Besser R cameras, but only the one without a number comes with a well-known M39 Leica thread mount. The other ones do have a Leica M mount and are therefore significantly more expensive and not a poor man's thing anymore. The overall design is very close to the one of a Leica M. There is the large and very bright viewfinder with a bright and clear rangefinder patch. Size and the position of all important elements are very close to the one of the Leica. The rangefinder measurement base is maybe a little short, but it is still good enough for fast primes with a normal focal length of 50 or 35 mm. It is also possible to switch between three configurations of frame lines for different focal ranges inside the viewfinder. The build quality is not very much Leica on the other side. The body seems to be very plasticky and especially the back door is dampened with some rubber material which can get sticky over time. The Voigtlander Besser R is a fully mechanical camera. It provides a faster shutter speed of 1 to thousands and goes down to 1 second. And if this wouldn't be enough, there is also a light meter placed inside the camera body measuring through the lens. There are no exposure automatics built in the camera. The light meter is only used to measure a light intensity and gives feedback with three LEDs inside the viewfinder. There are two arrows for under and over exposure and a dot for the correct exposure. I find it most practical to choose an exposure time and change the aperture value to a setting where the exposure is correct. On the battery side there are also no problems to be expected. The Besser R needs two LR44 batteries, which are very common nowadays and can be bought easily. As for all cameras, the M39 Leica thread mount makes the possible look of the images very variable. You can use old Soviet M39 lenses and get a 30s or 40s retro style look of a Leica 3 for example, or you can choose the modern and more expensive Voigtlander lenses to get a year 2000s clean and contrasty look as with modern Leica M lenses for example. I have chosen a Canon M39 50mm f1.4 lens which you can still find for not that totally crazy prices from Japanese sellers. Ok, let's sum it up again. The Besser R is a really interesting camera, very capable and very variable. As for the Canonet, the prices went a little crazy over time. I got mine for 200 euros a year ago, but today you will find it more likely for 400 to 600 euros. It is very close to a Leica M camera in look and feel, except for the lower build quality.
last but not least, there is another, more obvious way to get a Pullman's Leica. You can just go straight away and buy a real Leica. Of course, I'm not talking about the massively overpriced M-mount Leicas. I'm talking about the nearly forgotten R-mount SLR Leicas. The Leica R4, for example, was my way into the Leica system. These older bodies are relatively cheap and go under 100 euro if you keep looking for a while. Of course, there are also some exceptions, like the Leica R6.2, which is a fully mechanical camera and massively overpriced. But the R4 and R5 are still little gems. One downside is that the R-mount lenses are increasing in price again. For example, a 50mm Summicron goes around 400 euro, a Zoomilux around 1400 euro. And of course, the SLR Leicas may not have the charm of an M-mount Leica, but the lenses are still very fine and literally Leica-esque. There are also a lot of functions packed inside the Leica R4. It has two light metering methods, a time value, an aperture value and a program automatic. Fully manual shooting is also possible. Again, LR44 batteries are needed, which is very nice. The fastest shutter speed is also 1 over 1000, which was increased with the R5 to 1 over 2000. Also, you get all the benefits of an SLR system. When shooting in Leica R, you look directly through the lens. This makes lenses possible that a rangefinder camera cannot support well. For example, you get access to longer focal length, up to 800mm. There is a whole lineup of zoom lenses, the M system does not offer. And the close focusing distance is normally better with an R mount lens. My camera works very fine, but I've read about some issues with the mirror not opening totally anymore when hold horizontally. You may have a look for that if you want to get one. Sadly, Leica stopped the service for the old SLR lineup. So, if you have a damage or want to get a repair, workshops and spare parts may be a problem. But honestly, this is also the case for the other mentioned cameras. Especially repairs of electronics of any old film camera will be almost impossible. This is the reason why the fully mechanical R6 and R6.2 are the most expensive ones in the Leica R lineup. But let's try to give it a positive turn. Because Leica does not care about the R mount system anymore, a poor man can afford getting into this system. So, the final conclusion. I would say the R mount Leicas are the most real poor man Leicas in this list. Cameras and lenses are significantly less expensive than the M mount Pendant. They are per definition real Leicas, and when working well, the lens lineup is very superb. Don't forget that in these modern times with mirrorless cameras, you can give an R-mount lens a second life by adapting it. So that's it for today. I hope you found this list interesting and may get some new ideas and inspiration. Or it may help you if you just suffer a severe Leica guess. If you have other cameras in mind which have to be mentioned in a poor man Leica's list, feel free to write it into the comments. I'm looking forward to what else there is on the market. Maybe I get a little guess by myself. Now, finally, we have reached the end of the video and therefore the famous last YouTube words have to be spoken. Please leave a like or a comment. And if you like this video, please have a look for my other stuff and maybe subscribe to the channel. I would really appreciate it. Bye.